Okay, we have a quorum and it's 7.30, good. Oh, so, um, I am gonna, you know, if I keep doing this, maybe eventually I'll have this uh, recitation completely memorized. Uh, so, uh, my name is Charlie Foskett. Uh, I'm calling the meeting to this order. This meeting is being recorded. Chair of the Finance Committee, please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. So, members, when I call your name, uh, please answer um, in the affirmative. Grant Gibeon? Shane Blundell? Here. Uh, John Ellis? Carolyn White? Mary Margaret Franklemont. I'm here. Arif Padaria. Jonathan Wallach. Here. Uh, Brian Beck. Peter Howard. Here. Charlene Pokris. Sh Shailene Pokris. Uh, Daryl Harmer is not going to be here. John Dice. Here. Alan Jones. Here. Andy LaCourt. Here. Uh, Bill Keller. Here. Al Tosti. Here. George Koser. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. David McKenna. Here. Thank you, David. So, uh, Peter, I have that um, Grant Gibeon, John Ellis, Carolyn White, Arif. Uh, Grant Gibeon is here. Grant Gibeon is here. Okay. Uh, Brian Just Beck doing. isn't here. Sh Shailene isn't here. And that's it. Okay. Uh, uh, Charlie, I just joined. Oh, Shailene is just here. Welcome, Shailene. Thank you. Brian Beck has joined. Okay. So it looks like <laughs> there, are 20, there are 20 people in the meeting right now. All the stragglers are coming in. Okay. <laughs> Dean here? Not yet. He wasn't when I called. No, when I called. No, I don't see him yet. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're also anticipating speak. Uh, Liz Diggins is here. Yes. We're also uh, anticipating speakers uh, Aaron Zwerko and uh, perhaps Jenny Rate uh, from the planning department. Aaron is online. I'm this, here. This open meeting of uh, the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, all the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all the meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to ediggins at town.arlington.ma.us. For this meeting, the Finance Committee is convening by Zoom uh, conference uh, by Zoom app that's posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that you care not to share screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials have been provided uh, to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public's encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. We're now turning to the first item of the agenda. Um, some ground rules for clear and effective uh, conduct of our business. Uh, the chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, we'll go down the line of the members inviting each to make, make any comment, questions, or motions. Uh, please hold uh, your comments until your name is called. Further, remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Uh, if you wish to engage in, engage in a colloquy with other members, uh, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote uh, taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Thank you very much.
So, good evening, everybody. Um, the uh, let's see a couple of items. First of all, I wanted to thank Liz for preparing the uh, there's a, in the uh, detailed agenda that I sent out a few minutes ago. There's a, a comp. Uh, a comparison between the old warrant numbers and the new warrant numbers. You may recall there was a final warrant sent out on Friday and then there was a final final warrant sent out on Monday. And the um, list of warrant articles with the old and new numbers are uh, attached to that the document that I sent. Uh, so we're still struggling with the issue of whether we're having a meeting on March 24th or 31st. Um, apparently there are two candidate nights. Originally my announcement about the 24th was so that members could attend what it has been referred to as the town meeting candidates night. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think we can afford to not have both meeting uh, or, or not have a meeting on both nights. So I don't know if there's any, anybody has any comments or, um, you know, preferences here with respect to um, which meeting they would want to attend. Any Perfect. thoughts? Charlie, do we really think it's two meetings? Well, I, I think Shane, Shane, didn't you send me a note to that effect today? Yes, Charlie. Thank you. Um, so on the town website, it reflected that there was a March 31st, but I looked on the League of Women Voters of Arlington and it seems that to reflect the two different dates. So um, okay. the 24th was the town meeting member night. And I believe the 31st is the sort of I assume like the select board and other townwide offices. Yeah, that's right. the debate night then. Yeah, Charlie, yeah. since a lot of us are running for town meeting, yeah, I mean, my, my preference would be to be available for the town meeting candidate night. And, I, and the other one is probably hopefully be recorded anyway. Yeah, that would be my preference <clears throat> and I'm running and I have a race. Okay, so, well, yeah, we, can I? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So it's Dean. So I, I think there are, I, I'm in general agreement with the prior two people, I just have a small um, nuanced point. Mm -hmm. um, because, so I agree that we, I think we should be available for the 24th. Um, the, the other challenge we have is um, because of the pandemic, the school committee is voting on their budget this year, the latest that they ever have, which is Thursday the 25th. That doesn't put them in front of the finance committee until that second candidate's night. And two of the members of the school committee need to appear at that candidate's night, one being the current chair of the committee. And so they have, I think they've talked to League of Women Voters and they'll put them first, but they won't be able to show up to us until eight o'clock. Yeah, I've already communicated with Jane Morgan and um, arranged that. So I think we're, we're good there. So, okay, so let's let's plan on not having the meeting on the 24th, but having this the meeting on the second date, okay? All right. Um, I also, uh, anybody who, who uh, has not yet submitted uh, uh, to Liz that you have your budgets ready, please, please do so. And uh, a member had asked about uh, our policy about supporting local candidates in local elections. And the, um, the issue that was raised was that the Arlington Housing Authority candidates race is really independent of anything the town of Arlington or the finance committee or town meeting does. Is it, in, so it's, it's sort of a, a theoretical question, is it really a local race? Uh, because we don't have any um, prohibition against supporting, you know, one person or another for governor or whatever, um, you know, district, uh, state attorney general or, or so forth. So, and in fact, the Arlington Housing Authority, from my viewpoint, is essentially a state agency with some local representatives on it. But we don't, as a town, we don't have any impact on its budgets or, you know, their rules or whatever. That's all managed by the state. So uh, I consulted with uh, another member of the appointing authority, and I also consulted with our former chair, who's had many years of experience in these matters. And uh, the conclusion we came to is that it's not a problem. So if you want to support somebody for 
the housing authority race, it's not in conflict with our request that you not participate in, you know, not comment and support uh, local candidates. Uh, the only uh, restriction or request is that when you do so, you don't identify yourself as a finance committee member, that you're a private, private person, okay? All right. Um, minutes, Peter Howard. Thank you, Charlie. Um, <clears throat> the minutes of, of uh, March 10th and March 15th um, have both been made available for uh, members to review. I've gotten uh, feedback from Charlie, but, but nobody else. I've made Charlie's changes. Um, I, <clears throat> I uh, move that they be accepted as, as uh, released. Uh, is there a second? Second. So uh, for the minutes of March 10th, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, let me take a vote, Grant Gibeon. Aye. Shane Blundell. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Mary Margaret. Yes. Arif. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Be uh, Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene uh, Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Uh, he's not going to be here tonight. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Well, Bill Keller. Aye. Alan Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yeah. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. And then on the, on the minutes of yes. March 15th, um, so I know that everybody is here. Is there anybody who's going to vote against the minutes of March 15th? So uh, I'm going to assume that we took the roll call vote on the minutes of March 15th and we have approved both of those minutes. So that brings us to the next item on the agenda. And um, we're happy to have Aaron Zorko with us tonight. I don't know if Jenny Raid is here or not. Um, also, um, is there anybody from the public? No. Okay. So, yeah. Pardon? There was one person from the public. Is it Mariah? I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Oh, Micaiah? Micaiah's Micaiah? here and Karen Kelleher. And Karen Kelleher. Sorry. Okay. So we have two. Um, and Elizabeth uh, Carr Jones, it looks like, is also here. Yes. Yep. Elizabeth Carr Jones. Yeah. Oh, I thought that might have been Alan. Yes. Well. And Erin is. We're, in we're closer related. <laughs> Hello, Karen. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm just listening in. Okay. Thank you. So, um, well, we always are glad to have uh, people attending. Um, so, Erin, um, the floor is yours on article, the new article 25. Am I correct on that? It's the new, new newly renumbered article 25. Uh oh, did we lose Erin? No, I'm here. Um, thank you. Um, I, I wasn't aware that the articles were being renumbered. Um, and uh, Jenny will be joining us very shortly. Um, so, uh, but yes, the um, home rule legislation, um, or home rule petition for establishing a real estate transfer fee. Um, and uh, I, I'll point out that Karen Kelleher um, is, is one of our housing plan implementation committee members. Um, so we've been um, working on this article diligently uh, since um, 2019. So the real estate transfer fee um, was uh, originally um, uh, looked at by the Housing Plan Implementation Committee in late 2019 um, as a companion article to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, the, uh, both had been submitted to the 2020 annual town meeting but of course, um, the annual town meeting last year was delayed and then shortened and condensed. Um, so the real estate transfer fee was resubmitted in um, the fall for the 2020 special town meeting in November and was adopted overwhelmingly. Um, so we, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee is now turning their attention to um, the refiling of the real estate transfer fee, um, which is uh, the article that's in front of you tonight. 
And so the, the real estate transfer fee is a home rule petition um, and it does require, um, you know, should it be adopted by town meeting would require the submittal of it um, or the filing of it in the legislature um, by our delegation. Um, so that would be the next step. But, as, but essentially what a real estate transfer fee um, does is to uh, assess a fee. Um, it is a tax on the arm's length transactions of real estate in Arlington. Um, it, the uh, home rule petition is written um, to give flexibility to the select board should it be approved by the legislature to, um, to, to um, focus in on three major pieces which is the um, threshold of arm's length transactions that the fee would capture, the actual amount of the, the percentage amount of the fee, and then the third item would be the, um, whether it's the buyer, buyer's responsibility, the seller's responsibility, or some sort of division of responsibility between those two entities. The home rule petition um, is written to uh, uh, establish a number of um, exemptions from the fee. This includes transfers between household members, um, transfers um, due to life events such as a death or a divorce, um, transfers between um, the town of Arlington and other um, municipal or you know jurisdictional entities like the Commonwealth or the county um, or the the, the town. Um, other exemptions include um, the uh, between um, uh, transfers of um, affordable housing properties that are subject to a deed restriction, and among others. Um, and then, and then the home rule petition lays out how the town would assess the fee, giving the ability to um, the treasurer to um, put liens against property if the fee is not received um, at the um, at the filing of the deed. Um, and, and other sorts of mechanisms to effectively um, manage this, this uh, type of transfer. Um, and then finally, um, it does require that all of the revenue um, be um, deposited into the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, again, which was uh, adopted at the, the special town meeting in the fall. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that Jenny um, has joined us. Um, so I'll see if she has um, something to add on to um, my brief introduction. And then of course, we're happy to answer questions. Hi, Jenny, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Erin. Um, I'm Jenny Reid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. I, I think I'll, I'll let the Finance Committee you know, ask questions at this point. I don't have anything to add, but I will jump in when necessary. I, I'm guessing you already talked about the Housing Plan Implementation Committee and Karen is also on. Okay, so that's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so are there questions for uh, Aaron or Jenny on this uh, subject? Let's see. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Aaron, Jenny, thank you for being here tonight. Um, uh, I just want to say, first of all, that I am um, wholeheartedly in support of, uh, of the warrant article to um, put forward the home rule petition. Um, but am I correct in my understanding that it's the decision for whether to adopt the uh, real estate transfer free is, is ultimately up to the residents of the town, that it has to go before the, the residents in a, in a Townwide vote. Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, ultimately, should the legislature um, approve the home rule petition and it be sent back to the town of Arlington um, for the development of a bylaw, then yes, the ultimately it does need to be added to a ballot um, of um, a local election. So it it is within the um, it does require you know a vote of of the community. Okay. Thank you. Al uh, Jonathan, is that is that all you have? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Al Tassi. Yes, uh, the uh, budgets for the uh, Human Resources and the uh, Arlington Community Preservation Act both have funds in it for uh, homeless uh, uh, 
that go to the Somerville Homeless Coalition uh, to support uh, homeless people uh, in the town of Arlington. Could these funds uh, raised through this transfer fee be used for that purpose? Uh, I, I believe that it could be used for that purpose, um, as um, was probably discussed when the Finance Committee um, uh, learned about the Affordable Housing Trust in the fall. Once the um, Board of Trustees are um, appointed and get rolling, they do need to establish an action plan. And within that action plan, um, the Board of Trustees for the, the Affordable Housing Trust um, can set their priorities and goals. Um, so. So within that um, action plan, it could be um, any uh, uh, activities relative to um, providing affordable housing for um, folks that are um, uh, along the income spectrums um, that is established by the trust. So, and that includes folks um, that uh, may be homeless and um, need to find uh, affordable housing. So I do think that it could be um, a use of these funds, um, at, you know, should the Board of Trustees of the Affordable Housing Trust select that the, um, that homelessness is an action that they, they want to um, address through their, their activities. Al, anything else? That was it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, George, uh, no, I'm sorry, Peter Howard. Uh, thank you. Uh, is the uh, is the thing that you ex uh, explained, uh, Aaron? Is that available in printed version? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I uh, didn't follow your question. The uh, document that's going to go to the, to the state for uh, uh, approval. Yep. Um, so once the um, should uh, town meeting authorize the submittal of um, a home rule petition, um, it, it is anticipated that we would work with, work with our local delegation um, to format um, the essentially what is the main motion um, that was provided to the finance committee um, in advance of this um, meeting in the format that would be acceptable for the legislature without changing the the substance of the. Um, of the, uh, the actual text of the motion. So, so that has been posted um, on the Housing Plan Implementation Committee's page um, throughout the course of the development of this. Um, so it, it, can be, um, it can be found by the general public there. Peter, I think uh, Liz distributed uh, those documents a few days back. They're in your in-mail and I, I think they're also on the SharePoint site. I'll go looking for them. All I found was uh, the video. I, I, I have another question too. Um, does the trust fund have members yet? It, um, it does not have members yet. Um, the attorney general um, is uh, still uh, completing their review of um, the action of the special town meeting. I understand from uh, Ms. Brazil, um, the town clerk, that that, uh, that review is required to be completed by March 21st. So once we receive that approval, um, the town can seek um, appointments for, or seek um, volunteers that would be willing to be appointed to that board of the trustees. Thank you. George Koser. I'd just like to ask what the timeline is likely to be for this, assuming for the moment that it's approved at town meeting. It sounds like we have a town meeting vote, a home rule petition, then a bylaw change, um, setting the rate and then, or, or sorry, setting some of the uh, criteria of who, who pays. And then the select board votes to set the rate and there may be something else that I've missed. So could you just walk me through please when these things might happen are we talking about a year or more it um it would likely be a minimum of two years the legislative session um has just opened um uh in january um so the home rule petition uh, would be submitted by our local delegation to the um the legislative session um and the the legislature could take it up within the within the next two years or um you know by time town meeting completes the next year and a half um so uh, and it, it's 
it's uncertain when the legislature might vote on um, on a home rule petition. I will note that there there is some groundswell around um, real estate transfer fees. Um, there are a number of other municipalities that have submitted home rule petitions. And then there's also a local option um, legislation that was also filed both in the in the House and in the Senate. Um, so, there, so there is some coalescing around this effort, which might shorten that timeline. But I think at a minimum, um, the town would be looking at two years. We have home rule, then we need another town meeting for the bylaw change. Mm -hmm. Presumably the select board wouldn't require a huge amount of time for, for their action. Yep. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to get a sense of when this might be actually something that's in a budget. No problem. Dean Carmen. George, could you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Dean, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, how many other municipalities, two questions. One, how many other municipalities have this type of fee in place right now? Uh, no other municipalities have a transfer fee for affordable housing. Um, Nantucket has one for open they've space. The, they've got the land bank tax. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But nobody has, but those are largely but those are largely residential communities like Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. And are they attaching it to real estate in the way that you guys are doing it? Uh, so um, Nantucket, uh, Somerville, Cambridge, Boston, um, Concord, um, I think Brookline, and um, maybe I'm missing one or two other local municipalities um, all have pending home rule petitions for um, a real estate transfer fee on um, all types of arm's length transactions um, with the funding to go directly towards affordable housing into their respective affordable housing trusts. Right, but no one has it. No so, one has it. So you have improved, you have no proof of concept of how the mechanics would work. The right? proof. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you this question. Um, I read your, I read your document if um, Citizens Bank, a multi-billion dollar company is sold on its controlling interest and they own either of the land parcels for the bank, they owe you money. That's correct. Even though, but even though the, so how are you gonna value the consideration given in let's say a $20 billion transaction to the town of Arlington? The, and how um, are you gonna collect it? Like, it seems like you've created a, it's very broad. I'm getting to the point, it's very broad, but I don't see how you're gonna implement it. Yep, I understand. Um, so there, um, it, it's, it has a similar um, effect as existing, um, the existing stamp tax that the Registry of Deeds um, collects on arm's length transactions now. But it um, doesn't though, because in the example I gave you, they sold corporate shares of an entity. The, the, the asset of a corporation meaning the land is incidental to that business. It's not their business. They're not, Citizens Bank is not in the property management business. They're in the banking business. But your, your specific wording here says that if shares within an LLC or a corporation are transferred. Um, yes, yeah, transfer of a controlling interest in a trust, limited liability company or other entity that directly or indirectly holds an interest in any real property situation in the town of Arlington. Yep. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm just not sure how that would actually, um, you know, in your example, how that would actually, um, you know, occur on the, you know, should that transaction happen and a fee is in place. Um, I, I can certainly um, find out more information from some of the other communities that I've been working at, with and perhaps they've looked into that question in particular. Because that would also agree, like if, if Trader Joe's owned or Walgreens owned their real estate or CVS. And because like, so CVS does acquisitions all the time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say the building is, you know, in a $10 billion deal of the, what they're buying, but you're saying it's got to be subject to a tax now. It seems like what I'm afraid of is you're, you've, 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 with good intentions, you've created unwittingly a bureaucracy for commercial transactions that we're then going to be back here talking about how the general fund needs to, to needs to staff like two people to do appraisals and business valuations and we have to have consultants and all sorts of stuff. 
And now I don't know how we're going to do that. That's my concern. I understand the question. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to um, dig into it and provide additional information to the committee. Thank you. Are there any other questions uh, for Aaron or Jenny? So, um, so I, I see uh, on your chart there, you have uh, different thresholds of taxation um, and you have uh, different percentages of the transfer fee. So in the mid range with a, a roughly a 450 or $500,000 threshold, it indicates of, I think it was $4 million uh, raised. Is that, is that based on um, the average uh, how number of housing transactions in Arlington? Yep, um, so I worked with uh, um, the assessor's office to access um, the data that they have related to um, arm's length transactions, um, both commercial and residential transactions in the town of Arlington in 2020. Um, and using that information, um, which included the sale price of the property, um, and some quick math, um, I filtered for um, transactions that were above the variety of thresholds and then calculated um, what the revenue would be um, based on um, the percentage uh, fee. So you can see um, there's three different thresholds um, that I included. The statewide um, median single family home price for 2020, which was $445,500. The um, Arlington um, state, uh, excuse me, the Arlington median single family home price, which um, according to banker and tradesman was 86,000 or 86, uh, sorry, $860,000 last year. Um, and then a threshold of a million dollars. Um, so I, I, we selected these thresholds based on um, the other home rule petitions that are out there um, and the local option. Um, and um, then filtered for those uh, transactions that exceeded those amounts um, and then applied the percentage. Um, so for example, um, if the fee were to be assessed on um, transactions that were greater than or equal to uh, uh, $850,000, and if, you, if, the, if a um, fee of 0.5% was um, uh, uh, assessed, um, the, the revenue would be $1.3 million as an estimate. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see the other, the range of um, thresholds and percentages here. And um, uh, on this question, it would, it would be interesting to hear if the, um, if the finance committee members have uh, an opinion on any of these thresholds or percentages. Um, as we continue to um, refine the, um, the article for consideration by town meeting. So as a, as a follow-up question and, and Dean and Peter, I'll get back to you in a second. Um, so at, at, at the 1% level, which was one of your columns on the $400,000 threshold, it looks like uh, it would raise $4 million or so in annual taxes. So um, I think our, our tax raise every year is about, it's about a hundred million or something in that order. I don't, does anybody remember what that number is? Dean, do you know? I, I, I think it's, we have a $150 million budget, but I, I can't remember how much of it state aid versus the local tax raise, but I think it's in the $110 million range. About uh, 120, 140 this year. Is it 140? Okay. Yeah. So um, I would say that that's uh, that looks like a uh, something equivalent to a three percent increase in taxes. Uh, what would you? I mean, if you did that every year, um, that's, this is quite a significant amount of money. What is going to happen to that money? Uh, so. Uh... Hopefully, it would be used to um, create affordable housing opportunities. Um, again, the the board of trustees in developing their action plan um, should you know should this proceed, um, they can 
think a little bit grander and a little bit bigger um, than uh, they might have been able to uh, think if they were um, accessing um, uh, revenue from an, um, another sort of um, uh, fee that the town has imposed, such as um, the, the community impact fee on um, marijuana or on short-term rentals, um, which could be transferred to the trust. Um, but with you know four million dollars, certainly the um, the projects that they could envision are grander than um, what has you know what has been um, developed in the town of Arlington um, you know to date. It could include you know acquisition of property. It could or multiple properties for that matter. It could include. Um, partnering with a developer to create more affordable housing opportunities, um, act, act, um, act acquiring property and actually putting the funds into, into a development budget. Um, so so this, this, um, this level of revenue really does unlock the ability to actually create units on the ground quickly um, with, with partnerships. Has your group done any studies of um, what the, the uh, <clears throat> impact of this tax is on real estate sales. And in other words, the value, taxpayers' homeowner value. Uh, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee has not done studies in, um, in that detail. However, um, based on my conversations with um, staff in the city of Somerville and uh, folks in the town of Concord, um, which both of which have done um, more detailed studies um, in their efforts to uh, uh, establish a home rule petition. Um, and both groups found that there is, um, there's, there's limited impact on the real estate market and that, the, um, uh, that this is the best resource to create um, continuous and sustainable revenue to fund affordable housing activities. Annie Court. Yes. Um, so I'm hoping you'll know the answer to this question, Aaron, or that maybe Danny knows the answer to the question. We provide through CDBG and through the uh, CPA um, uh, funds to the Housing Corp of Arlington to build affordable housing in town. And my recollection from my time on the Board of Selectmen was that when they receive funds from us, they are able to leverage that money 10 to one. So for example, that if you had $3 million in the affordable housing trust and the HCA was contemplating a project, they could turn that $3 million into $30 million of additional funding with which to build housing. Am I uh, order of magnitude off or am I in the neighborhood? Uh, I'm not sure of the magnitude, but you're certainly accurate in terms of being able to leverage um, funding. Often the local sources of funding are the, the first committals into affordable housing development. Um, and it does enable, um, for example, the Housing Corporation of Arlington to position themselves to um, leverage the local funding for funding through the state or um, you know, through other federal government um, uh, uh, grants. Um, uh, perhaps uh, Jenny wants to add anything to it? I, I think that actually summarizes it quite well. I mean, it's both a leverage, but it is a multiplier, to your point, Annie, um, right. by a lot. And in doing affordable housing development, you need a lot of resources, usually more than 10 resources go mm -hmm. in. I mean, it's not, you know, you have one resource and you just go to the bank and get private financing and maybe a grant. It's over many, many years to do development. Even the nine units at Westminster mm -hmm. um, in the example of Housing Corporation of Arlington took many years to put together and many different resources. So it is a leverage and a multiplier, um, but it is also something that could be banked um, for mm -hmm. bigger acquisitions as well because of the uh, nature of depositing the funds into the trust. Uh, where we would be able to, if we had a bigger opportunity to preserve or create affordable housing, the town would be able to pursue that when it's ready at a certain time um, with a sufficient amount of, of capital in order to as either assist with such an acquisition or move forward with something. 
Um, and there could be a, there's a lot of different examples of what that might mean. So I think it's a it's a really good question about where the money goes. It also is a reflection of the limits of our existing resources mm -hmm. and how um, it's important to add to them um, when possible. Okay, so let me follow that up with another question. One of the warrant articles that'll be before town meeting this year, in addition to this article is one to um, uh, locally force uh, our affordable housing efforts in the town, our, our um, inclusionary zoning, so on and so forth to um, only uh, fund projects where the area median income of the tenants is at 60% or less. And that, uh, from my experience in affordable housing, is a very difficult number to deal with, but it is a number that we might be able to achieve in some projects if we were able to provide this kind of funding to those projects, particularly potentially 40B projects, because every time you reduce the total investment that is mortgaged and has to be repaid, you increase the cash flow on the property and therefore allow for those affordable rents to be lower than they might be otherwise to make what's called the pro forma, that is your balance of financing and your ability to repay that financing work, which is part of why affordable housing is so complicated because of those pro formas. Am I correct in my assumption that it would give us that kind of flexibility in assisting someone in developing affordable housing in town? Absolutely. It's a very good example. Um, and the pro forma is everything to affordable housing development, both, uh, you know, uh, when pulling together the deal to ultimately uh, walking away potentially with a, a fee so that you can then capitalize another project in the future. Great. And so in addition to giving us financial leverage, it might give us some leverage on the kinds of affordable housing that are developed because we would have skin in that game. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Annie, anything else? I guess not, okay. Um, Alan Jones. Thank you, Charlie. Um, it, when we're starting to look at these numbers, it's uh, it's an awful lot of money and um, I'm not sure how that translates to you know number of units that could be made available. Uh, as affordable housing, but it makes me start thinking about land use and density. We're, we're always uh, complaining about the lack of available space for commercial development, um, you know, density, traffic, and school enrollment, uh, things like that. Uh, so have you taken these numbers and translated them into the number of units we're talking about and how that, you know, impacts land use, density, school enrollment? Uh, those things. In other words, I, I'm just wondering what the impact of how many additional units we're talking about and what the impact that is to the general, you know, feeling of the town. Uh, so uh, I have not actually done that exercise to say like, you know, you need X number of dollars to, afford, um, to create an affordable unit. And if you did the quick math, this is the number of units that you would come up with. Um, I can um, look to the examples, um, you know, the examples from the Housing Corporation of Arlington, see what their total development cost is per unit and, and apply it to the information that we've provided. Um, I, ju I just don't know off the top of my head the, what the all-in cost is per unit. Um, and I, I'd ask if Jenny um, wanted to jump in, if that's something that she um, knows. I was just thinking of our recent memo to the ARB about mm. development costs actually, and the, the average cost per unit with the land. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, but I, I think to your larger question um, about the impact, I guess I kind of go back to the funding would go into this trust and the trust is going to have an action plan that will look at how they wanna allocate and appropriate you know, the, the funds towards affordable housing. So it's really the trust will need to adequately understand and prepare for how to plan for that type of development, whatever they're planning to pursue. If we're talking these amounts of funds, they'll need to have a, a very strong action plan to move forward with. Um, but weighing every single one of those impacts right now, I'm not sure would be uh, a helpful exercise 
because it would be quite speculative at best. Okay, I guess I'm just looking for sort of an order of magnitude. I mean, it, it's potentially a lot of money a year yeah. that could potentially go on forever. And and I'm wondering, is it five new units a year, a hundred new units a year? And you know, what are the yeah. what are the limits to growth just based on the density of the town we already have and the lack of space for commercial? I think, purposes? yeah, sure. I think it goes back to Annie's question a bit, which is you need a lot of funds to capitalize affordable housing preservation as in acquiring acquiring a building and making sure units are affordable in perpetuity um, and creating new housing, either one of those situations. In the first example, there aren't, there isn't necessarily new development happening. The second example may include new development, right? So there's two different scenarios there potentially with different outcomes. Um, in either one of those cases, there's also different costs per unit depending upon what you're getting into. So we can give you some averages in terms of how much it typically costs per unit, which is upwards to about $400,000, I believe. Is that right, Erin? Yeah, so the um, recent research that we did um, do it, um, we found that it's about $250 per square foot of um, affordable housing um, for, to develop affordable housing. So if you're looking at, you know, a thousand square foot unit, um, just to use round numbers, um, that is a $250,000 unit. Um, so then if you were to divide that by um, sort of the, the mid range of um, the, uh, the fee, um, you know, the table that was in the memo, um, if we go with, uh, you know, $2.5 million, um, I can't do math that quickly, but you could, um, you would be able to create it 10 sounds units. sounds like 10 units. Yeah. <laughs> So, so ultimately, you know, as has Jenny has pointed out, those the cost of developing affordable housing is is great, um, and it is expensive, and it does require many different um, uh, uh, funding sources all leveraged together. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, you, you may you're not going to be yielding um, units uh, as many units as maybe the val the dollar amount would suggest. Yeah. Okay. I guess I, I would like to see an order of magnitude estimate of, you know, take the, the forecasts based on, on what you're doing and, and some sort of average cost and, you know, just roughly how many, how many units per year uh, this would produce. And, and again, I am Aaron, starting to be concerned about land use intensity. Thank you. Alan, let me just interject the thought here. Aaron, I think your calculation is, perhaps, I'm not sure, but maybe missing something because um, typically housing is uh, financed, okay? So a $250,000, as your example, cost, um, if you had $250,000, you, you, uh, you might get four to eight times leverage on that. So you're, you're really talking about um, not, not 10 units a year, but maybe 40 or more with that money because people are, it's, it, it just doesn't disappear. People are gonna be paying money for that, for that living space and, and there's gonna be some sort of leveraged uh, financing. So I think you're off between a, you know, a factor of uh, five and 10 on those numbers. Uh, yep, uh, um, just keeping it simple, but it is a, a really great point um, and a point that has been brought up during this um, discussion about how um, you know, leveraging funds does open up additional funding. Uh, John yeah. Ellis? Oh, may I? It, it, it's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> let, let's let John Ellis get Okay. It. All right. I'll, I'll, if you don't mind coming back. Thank you. Thanks. John. Um, I'm also interested in the um, answer to the question that uh, Alan asked. And um, I, I do understand it's probably pretty quantifiable for the town to know how many portable units it's created um, and can project how many units it might create. I'm interested on the other side of the equation, which is, is the town tracking how quickly we're losing low and moderate income households and whether that rate of change is slower or faster than we're creating units. And I also wonder if the town is able to map the reduction in um, low and moderate income households to things like tax overrides and debt exclusion. Those numbers would be interesting to me to learn as well. 
Yes. Um, so uh, it's not uh, something that we actively track in the department. Um, however, this year we are undertaking an update to our housing production plan, which is to look at um, the demographics of, of all um, families and households across the income spectrum. Um, and uh, in, in, within that um, an, uh, study, that plan, um, the, there's a requirement to um, uh, assess the housing needs of, um, of uh, different types of households across the income spectrum, um, but also understand their demographics and the change over time. So I think that effort um, to update the housing production plan will um, illuminate some of the questions um, or some of the data points that you are looking for. And of course, with the lengthy timeline of a home rule petition, um, as as that um, you know, should this be adopted by town meeting, um, and as it uh, um, moves its way through the legislative process, um, more of that information will come out to inform the board of trustees for the affordable housing trust on um, where to focus their efforts. Thank you. That would be interesting, and I think that kind of information would be interesting more generally to the town as we consider tax overrides and things like that. The town had was able to estimate what that might mean for our ability to keep low and moderate income housing. That's the kind of data which would be very useful in a political discussion. Thank you, John. Uh, Jenny, you wanted to add a comment? Yeah, I'll. I'll add to what Aaron is saying right now, and then I'll go back to the other thing I was about to say, um, which I, I think, John, you raised some really interesting questions. I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about them, actually. So I, I'm, I'm glad to hear those, those as being, you know, it's just really thoughtful to consider uh, the issues of, of all incomes in the community and the impacts of any changes that we're considering. So I appreciate that very much. Um, the housing production plan, of course, has a limit <laughs> to how much we'll be able to, to study and get out of it. Um, I wanted to understand, though, when you asked how many low or moderate income people are impacted or have moved as a result of any changes, did you mean like living in deed restricted housing or did you mean more generally? Can you just clarify that for me? No, I, I was thinking about longtime Arlington families that are mm -hmm. moderate income. Uh, and, and maybe a fixed income um, and make a decision that, that, you know, Arlington's too expensive and sell and, and move to another community. And so reduce our population of moderate income people. And, you know, I, everybody makes decisions for many different reasons, but, you know, if you might see trends or you, you might see as the tax burden changed that, um, you know, those households were, were reduced. So I, I wasn't talking about people in moderate income housing. Okay. I was talking about moderate income people in, in uh, you know, regular Arlington housing. Yeah, I'm not sure we'd be able to track that by income, but we can, we can certainly follow up on that to learn a little bit more. What we do know is that there have been a significant number of condominium conversions in Arlington. We, uh, researched that and published it in our current housing production plan um, and a, a very high magnitude of units that had been uh, rentals and presumably, you know, market rate affordable rental housing was converted to condominiums. Um, so, you know, we have information like that, which doesn't necessarily tell us about the income of the people moving out. Um, but I, but I think we can probably dig into that a little bit more. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. It's sort of like a half half answer. Well, it sounds like these are related to questions you're asking. And maybe yeah. I'm gonna be studying. Okay. Yeah, as long as that's understood. Okay. Um, the other thing I was going to say before, just to add on, is that the housing production plan that we have indicates that um, if we were to try to produce enough affordable housing to meet the 10% threshold, which is of course a different way of calculating um, how much affordable housing we have as a community, um, we are hundreds of units away from that number. We only have 5.7% of our year round housing inventory designated as affordable housing. So we actually have, if we were using that as a, as a benchmark, we would have to produce a lot of units in order to, to get to that number. So 
Um, I think when we do the research that was requested um, by a couple of you with regard to the order of magnitude, I would want to couch it in the terms of how much affordable housing we actually need. Um, so we can provide that certainly to the committee. It's a great question. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Al Tosti? Yes, two questions. Uh, can this, and I apologize if I missed this answer before, uh, could these funds be used for rent subsidies? Yes, um, they could, as long as it's, um, you know, something that the um, uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board of Trustees is, uh, would be interested in taking on. Um, that certainly would fall within the scope of activities that um, a trust fund could undertake. Second question, uh, the Board of Selectmen decide the level of sale and the rate do they do this annually so they could adjust it if they need to? They certainly could do it annually if they want to take on um, that, that annual um, requirement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dean Carmen. Yeah, so quick follow-up. Um, you know, you had said earlier that other towns, so nobody's implemented this, but other, other towns have. Uh, or, or have home rule legislation. And, and I'm trying to get my head around why we would want to be pioneers and in doing this. And let me give you why I, I would think we wouldn't want to be pioneers. So the first thing is we could pass home rule legislation and then get sued, right? So now the, the town is in court with litigation with somebody saying it's not constitutional, it's, it's, just, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing, right? And now the town has to pay for litigation defense in, in a matter, it's not really, um, it doesn't have a lot of history yet, right? And then the second thing I'd say is, you know, people, people with lots of money hire lawyers and accountants and professionals and people like me to not pay taxes to people like you, right? And so one thing I do here is I start to go through the document and my instincts stay like, well, okay, well, how would I get around this, right? And the first thing that comes up is I think to myself, you know, the, your, the, you say that for collection, we should, the town may use existing methods for collection. So if I'm selling my house, I'm just not paying it. I'm gonna tell you that up front, right? Because your existing method to collection would be to collect it from the guy I sold it to, guy, or woman, man or woman I sold it to. So that's their problem. I'm out, I'll go live in Florida and good luck to you, right? And I could, I, I could keep going, but what, why I'm gonna, again, it's not productive for me to keep going, right? But I guess the point becomes, since this hasn't been implemented before, you would now be the one who would implement it. You'd face the wrath. You'd face people like me who are trying not to pay you. The town's going to be in litigation. The town's going to be suing. And it's going to take five years, let's say 10 years to sort it out. So why is it worth all of that? Like, what's your pitch to say, we're willing to face lawsuits. We're willing to be in court. Why is it worth all that? And that obviously the side question, Don Point, is how are we going to pay for the lawsuit if it hits? Um, so, uh, so the the first question um, about what's the pitch? Um, I think that um, as has been pointed out um, in um, the conversation so far is that this this is a a way to create a renewable and sustainable. Um, revenue source to dedicate to affordable housing. But it why be first if other people are willing to be first and take the brunt of hammering it out? Why should we be first? Sure. Um, so, I, you know, there's no need to necessarily be first. I think it um, shows a real dedication to looking at innovative ways to fund affordable housing at the local level. Um, and I think that there is uh, some groundswell around this. Um, I think, you know, the home rule petition could potentially languish um, and, uh, you know, these sorts of questions may come out in the, um, the review by the legislature of the local option. Um, but I do think that there is um, a, an opportunity for Arlington to say affordable housing um, means a lot to the community. And through this type of um, tax, we can achieve um, 
you know, a, a level of um, funding for affordable housing that we have not been able to achieve in the past. Um, the CPA and the CDBG funds are um, typically oversubscribed. Um, so, and, and are um, at a, you know, a, a different um, level of ability to fund projects. Um, so I think that the, the pitch is, is that it, it really does say um, Arlington um, is dedicated to this and um, finds that this is important and that this is an innovative way to um, create that funding source for affordable housing. As it relates to um, the, your question about um, how to pay for the lawsuit um, that may or may not happen, um, I, I think that that is um, potentially a, you know, a concern with anything um, that, that is passed. Um, I, I don't pretend to know all the ins and outs of municipal finance, finance um, that where we where the town of Arlington may be able to pay for that type of lawsuit. Um, so I, I might look to Jenny to um, help me answer that question. I was going to answer the first part. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, for the people who know that we had a warrant article for paying for funds for the Mugar property, for example, year for maybe three years now. I'm not sure you, some of you are longtime town meeting members. So when we have, when we need to seek special counsel for things, I think it becomes a special appropriation is my understanding um, outside of our typical uh, legal counsel, uh, you know, regular budget. Um, so can I just say, can I just say to that? Hey, hey, wait, Jenny? Dean. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, let's not go ahead. argue. Yep. We're trying to get information from our guests. Okay. So um, it's not a debating contest. And in, ahead, in, in that spirit, um, I was just going to say that Arlington has actually been first before in advancing priorities that are important. For example, most recently when we, um, when town meeting adopted the uh, fossil fuel free buildings, essentially, you know, uh, that's an example of stepping in first, by the way, I think it was maybe, what, one of three or four communities, not even maybe just Brookline was the only community that had actually done it. So that's an example of, of stepping in to potentially hot water without knowing where it was going to go. Um, but doing it because it aligned with the community's priorities to address uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, you know, to advance a plan to get to 2050 uh, net zero. So I think that that's a great example of Arlington has, you know, certainly stepped out in front before when the priorities align um, with the goals. So I think it makes sense in that regard. Um, in this regard, I think um, there's actually a lot of examples of, of Arlington stepping forward and addressing affordable housing already. This is about ensuring that we have uh, adequate resources um, and not relying on the municipal budget in order to get there. So I think uh, it's another solution. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Dean, did you have any other questions? No, no I think I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um, Annie LaCourt. So Jenny, let me ask you a quick question or Jenny or Aaron about transfer taxes. Um, there is no community in Massachusetts that has a real estate transfer tax, but we're not inventing the idea here, correct? There are other communities. My recollection is the city of Philadelphia has had a transfer tax for a long time. Am that, I? No yep. you're, um, you're absolutely correct. Um, these um, types of transfer fees exist in um, many different um, uh, uh, jurisdictions, whether it's statewide or um, uh, city or county specific um, across the country. So presumably then they've been legally tested, at least with regards to any applicable federal law and probably with the local state laws. So we would have some kind of idea, some kind of case law that tells us what the likely challenges are to be. And hopefully our legislative delegation would also pay attention to what past challenges may have been and uh, assist us in adjusting our home rule petition to avoid those kinds of problems relative to the state constitution. Um, so, and then I, there's just something else said about rent um, subsidy that I wanted to make sure I understand clearly, Jenny. When we invest in an affordable housing property, part of what makes uh, rental properties affordable is there is a rent restriction so in that sense, all of our investments in affordable housing are essentially rent subsidy. What we're doing is creating units where we're guaranteed that the rate of rent will not exceed 
what the federal government has designed has defined as an affordable level for people at a certain income level. Am I right. correct or am I? You're absolutely correct. Yes. Yes. Every everything comes with a deed restriction and a restriction on how much the unit can be rented for, which is essentially a, which is a subsidy um, for the the individual or family that is residing in that unit. Um, if it is just simply a voucher to live somewhere as sort of a rental subsidy, which is sort of like the tenant assistance program that the town is operating right now because of COVID, um, that is also a possibility and not necessarily tied to a deed restricted uh, designated affordable unit, but simply just a subsidy to help people uh, with uh, maybe limited income to be able to afford their rent for a limited period of time also. Right, and so there's, there's two scenarios. There's some interaction between what we think of as Section 8, which is a federal voucher rent subsidy and the development of affordable housing because affordable purpose-built affordable housing is more likely to accept Section 8 tenants or to have access to federal program to build those units, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I think that's everything, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Did I, uh, Brian, did I see you raise your hand? Brian Beck? No. Okay. Um, Dean, do you have your hand up? No. Okay. Uh, I'm just not quick enough to put it down. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Aaron John, and hi, Jenny. Hi, hi, Are there hi, any hi. other questions for Aaron and Jenny? Oh, John Dice. Yes, go ahead. Um, Jenny, you, you pointed out that this is essentially a, a real estate transfer tax. And can't you just simply place a lien on the property to assure that that tax is paid? Uh, yes, you can. Um, the home rule petition would authorize the town to use um, existing uh, or to set liens on properties to ensure that the, the fee is paid. Yeah, so we're probably talking about quite a bit of money and a pretty effective way of collecting the money. Is that not true? Definitely true. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Very good. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. And thank you, Aaron. Aaron, a very nice presentation. Very thank uh, comprehensive. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I guess the next thing is budgets. Um, so is Arif here? No. OK, so we'll, uh, he asked the. That's right. He he sent me a note that he wouldn't be here. So, um, in the finance area, we have uh, parking. Brian, are you here? I'm here. I can do that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to attempt to um, put up something. So, would I be allowed to mm -hmm. do that? Yep. You're all set. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if I'm capable. Technically capable. <laughs> Hope this is it. Oh, close, but not <coughs> close. Hang on, close, but no cigar. Cool. Uh, Manners should budge. There we go. Okay. Um, the parking budget hasn't changed very much. Um, if you go down to the page below on the salaries, if you look over here, you see the total for last year's um, salary was 42,927, but it doesn't add up. That's because there was a $500 stipend in 2020, uh, pardon me, 2021, that had, for whatever is, it's no longer there in 2022, but it, if you're comparing the numbers, it's not there. Um, so that's just in the arithmetic. So that's that $500 reduction. That's a, a stipend that's uh, gone. Um, there's an increase in the longevity, which is uh, statutory. Um, so there's really not much change on the salaries. There's um, nothing in the expenses, uh, except when I looked at it, uh, I asked about the printing. How much printing could there be for parking? And um, Phyllis, um, the town treasurer said, oh, that's the parking tickets. So that makes sense. The contractual services are for a VPN um, for the meters to talk to um, the town and um, so that they're all coordinated. So that's a contract with uh, Verizon. 
Um, and that'll come in about $5,000. The offsets here um, are from the parking district. And we'll go over that budget after we do this. And I'll, actually, I'll show you very quickly if you want. Um, right over here is the expense for the 37276 And there is the 37276 is in that budget. So I would uh, move that the parking budget be approved as printed at $58,056. Is there a second? Second. Second. So the parking budget has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? So hearing none, um, I will take uh, a vote. Grant Gibeon. Aye. Shane Blundell. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Mary Margaret Franklin. Yes. Arif's not here. Jonathan Wallach. Aye. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Uh, John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Uh, so the uh, parking budget has been uh, passed unanimously. Charlie? So, yes. In addition to that, uh, there's a warrant article for the parking district expenditures. Yes, please go ahead, Brian. Okay. Um, this is what we were waiting for this time. What's the new warrant article number on that? Um, hang on, I had it right here. Of course, I turned away from it. I, oh, believe, I, have it here too. I believe it's, is it 52? Let me see. 52. Fifty-two, yes. Okay. Um, the expenditures um, for the current, uh, for pardon me, for um, fiscal twenty-two is projected to be um, three hundred twenty-four thousand six seventy-three. Um, let me go back to my book that has all the explanations. It's mostly um, software up here. This IPS is the, uh, and, and, and by the way, Dean, correct me if I'm wrong which I'm sure I will be. Um, this is uh, system software and costs associated with um, uh, parking meters. IPS is, yes. Okay, um, the, then the next line is credit card fees. Yep. And that's software for that. Uh, coin collection is self-explanatory. That's um, collecting the actual cash. Um, there's a lease at the first parish that's $6,000 a year. Um, the $46,000 below that are actually for the lease of the parking meters because we do not own them. We're leasing them. The line below that is the parking enforcement, which I will take you to right now, which was the first page here, which was the police budget. And that's down here. That's the parking funds offset for the police department. Brian, you're getting pretty good with this uh, Zoom stuff. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, once you do it up and you don't screw it up too much, <laughs> actually you learn more from the screw ups than otherwise. Um, we discussed the uh, 37,000 from the parking meters. Um, then there's an upgrade of the modems and this 20,000 on the bottom line is what next year's expenditures are gonna be uh, for seasonal planting. Now, that's the expenditures. That's what I believe we're going to vote on in the um, Warren article. Separate from that, the current, here's a little bit of concern, but not, not dramatic, but is the current year $47,000 is the actual collections to date. They were budgeting about $500,000 for that. So the, that's because of the COVID. The number, the, um, the, the actual receipts are way down. So hence the amount of expenditures that they're doing is substan is gonna be substan uh, substantially less next year. Um, Phyllis gave me two estimates for the revenues. One is if everything gets back to normal, which it's possible, but I don't, I wouldn't expect that. 
Um, and that would be $556,000 worth of revenues. In addition, pardon me, separate from that, if there's nine months of normalcy, uh, that number would drop to 459. In either case, um, the next year's expenditures of 324 would still be covered by the 459. Now, the final piece in this puzzle is the actual cash on hand. Right now, there's $524,000 available in that revolving fund. Um, there's encumbrances and, and expenses that are projected. Now, these expenses are from the majority of them are uh, from prior year, from 21 and from 20 that haven't been completed. Um, they actually expect to have by the end of the year $106,000 worth of revenue. Right now, worth, I, I showed you it's about $47,000. So the actual cash balance at the end of the current year should be 169. And if you add that to the cash that they would expect to receive a 459, they should be flush with cash, able to handle all their expenditures. So I assume the number that we're voting, I believe, is 324,673. Yes. And I would make a motion that we accept that number. Is there a second? Second. So um, on uh, the Warren Article 52, the parking uh, district uh, revenues and expenses, um, is there any further discussion, any questions for Brian? I don't have my, uh, so least... Charlie? Yes, I'm sorry, I, I lost my, uh, participant screen here for a minute. There are three questions. Ah, I lost the pen. Uh, first one would be uh, John Ellis. Um, so the, the revenue is down uh, 10x in this picture, but maybe by the end of year, it'll only be down 5x. Would any of the expenses go down? Um, I guess lease payments would stay the same, but maybe coin collection in the previous fiscal year was also less. And I'm also curious to know, given that the parking people did other jobs in the police department, how that offset worked for the previous year. So I'm not phrasing this very uh, clearly, but um, we, we, we collected a lot less money in fiscal year 2021 because of COVID. Did we also have any reduction in spending or change the way that we account for parking district given that the uh, enforcement officers work in other jobs in the police department. Does that make sense? I, I believe I understand your question. I don't know the answers to the current expenses except to the extent that they might be included in here. Um, I know that they, they don't spend everything each year even though they have requested it. So I can't tell you the exact numbers. I, like I said, I was more interested when I was talking to her about the actual cash that they had to pay it. Because if they didn't, if they were spending the cash and didn't have the revenues, they wouldn't be, they'd, be, they'd, they'd fall flat on their face, they'd come up short. This tells me that indeed that they had, they either have cut back and or are not spending it. But if you're looking for a specific line item, I'm happy to ask. Um, I don't know that I need a specific number. I was just sort of like a general explanation for like. It. Well, it, the general explanation would be they wouldn't have the cash if they if they paid the expenditures, okay, and didn't really have the money coming in. They wouldn't yeah. they would they wouldn't have the cash. I, I, John, I think the expre the uh, the answer is that they paid it out of uh, retained earnings that fund balance. Hey, no. hey Brian, it's Dean. Yes. Can, you go, can you go back to the budget? Uh, that the budget page. Yep. Yeah. yeah, John, so no, no, and the first three line items are variable costs, the non the expenditures, the rest are fixed costs. Yeah. So um, I think what you're trying to get at is like Elevon is the credit card processing fee. So if revenue is a product of credit card processing, and you process fewer credit cards, you'll have lower numbers there. Coin collection is when it gets filled up. So you could cut that down if you're not having to collect the coin. 
And IPS is also a variable cost based on transactions. So I think it's that's also, when- The salary offset, right? Like the $70,000 in the budget book of salary offset, but they yeah. didn't do the job. So are they still offsetting the salary? I don't know that part. I think the problem there would be it was already budgeted for. So if they didn't terminate or furlough the employee, they would find themselves in a position where even if that person was working in another department, there, that department didn't have the budgetary resources to pay for them. Okay. okay. Um, is that good, John? Um, I think it's as good as I can hope for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Yes, thank you, Charlie. Um, Brian, could you just, ex uh, I'm just curious as to what some of these um, expenditure line items represent, in particular, the first parish lease, the single space modem upgrade, and then the parking benefit district expenditure. The parking district expense, let's go for, with that because it's right here. It's, they're, they're doing plantings in Arlington Center. Oh, okay. Thank okay, but for that one. Um, the first parish leases, they actually lease uh, the parking spaces. That, they, 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 they have to pay rent for it. That's, and that's what the 6,000 is. And the single space modem upgrade is, uh, that's a technical item to me, but so you know, they just need it to continue the uh, services. Okay, thank you. Uh, is, that, is that good, Jonathan? Yes, thank you. Uh, Alan Jones. Uh, thank you, Charlie. I just wanted to ask you if you could put these PDFs up on SharePoint. I've gotten really used to having all the documents there in the meeting folders. Alan, I tried. <laughs> okay, email them to me, Brian, and I'll put oh, them up. I'll email them to you, and uh, does Liz want a copy of them, or just email them to you? Yeah, I can do it, too. It doesn't matter. Email them to Liz, I, and I, she'll put I them up. I tried this on Sunday, by the way. <laughs> it didn't okay. work. Okay, as long as we can get them up there. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Peter Howard, you had your hand up before. I'm all set. I just couldn't read on the screen. Okay. Are there any other questions for Brian on the parking district uh, Warren article? 52. I don't see any on the, uh, oh, oh, wait, wait, Alan Jones, are you, you're, you're, you're done, right? I'm done. Done. Okay. Um, so there are no further questions. It's been moved and seconded, I believe. So let's uh, proceed with a vote. Grant Gibbion. Aye. Shane Blundell. Aye. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Mary Margaret Frankelman. Is she here? Um, she's on mute. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Aye. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Brokers. Yes. Uh, Daryl Harmer. He's not here. John Deist. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Andy Court. Yes. Uh, Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Yeah. Dean Carmen? Yes. And <coughs> yes. Uh, the vote is, uh, let's see, I don't know if it's any, any objections. Any, any objections? Uh, so, Mary Margaret, did you vote yes or no? I voted yes. Thank you. So, so the vote is unanimous. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Um, any more uh, budgets? I think we'll hold the uh, the IT budget until Arif is here. So, are there any more budgets uh, from the finance group that uh, are, are ready for tonight? I think that's it, except for the uh, IT. And, and, yeah, and then the next one we have to we have to wait for the insurance. Yeah. Okay, that's correct. We, yeah, the insurance should be. Uh, to be able to present the insurance budgets, both health and liability on Monday night, we're meeting with HR here in Malloy on Monday morning. So uh, if you don't hear otherwise, um, we'll be prepared to present the insurance Monday night. Okay, so uh, what I would like to do then is, uh, um, Christine, if it's okay with you to revert to the um, 
Public Works, which we uh, we we interrupted the other night. Um, I've actually forgotten where we were. We were on the maybe the administration budget discussing the differences in the expenses, but I don't I, think we, we got to any conclusion or vote. I think we left off at engineering. Engineering. Is that, is that correct, John and George? Sounds good. If, if uh, someone could put the PPW budget up on the screen, that'd be great because I can't. Uh, could you do that, Alan? So the engineering budget starts on page 90 of the manager's budget book. So you say engineering? Engineering. Okay. There we go. Um, so engineering, it, uh, this department oversees the all the construction projects in town and provides any technical assistance to um, the other DPW departments. Um, much of their expenses tend to um, be fluctuate based on what projects are anticipated. Um, there was a slight decrease in the salary um, budget and that was because there was a new hire at West Pay. Um, so that accounts for the, the slight reduction in the, um, the, the salary amount. Um, the, um, the, the, the 5202 maintenance line seems to suffer from the same affliction as the 5202 maintenance line that we were talking about in natural resources, which meaning the, the 19 and 20 actuals that you see are not really necessarily reflective of um, actual spent. Um, but what was provided to us by uh, Julie Wayman and Sandy Pooler um, suggests that the budgeted amount that they, um, the manager is asking for at twenty five thousand, is um, is merited in terms of how much they've been actually spending this year and in prior years. Um, the other large expense is five three five five mobility improvements, um, and this is um, in the DPW budget for for anticipated implementation of whatever projects the planning department comes up with. It's the, the, um, the mobility plan is really a planning department um, project. Um, so this is sort of uh, in the budget sort of as a placekeeper and, and to have some money available to be able to implement what improvements um, the planning department the town manager comes up with. I, I think can correct me, um, George and John, if I'm wrong, that 14,388 that was spent in 2020 was for a um, consulting fee. Yes, um, that's correct. And I think the amount is correct for, for the uh, DDW director. Um, so with that, I would move that the engineering budget be approved as contained in the manager's budget. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded uh, on the um, the engineering budget uh, for for uh, where's the total? Um, six three. One hundred sixty. I'm sorry, there is one hundred sixty-three thousand eight hundred seventy-three dollars. So are there any questions uh, for Christine or uh, George and, and John on the uh, on this budget? So I, I have one question about the mobility improvements, um, which you say come from the planning department. What are they specifically, do you know? No, uh, we don't know and it, we asked. Uh, Mike Rodenmacher and and he really didn't have an idea either of what we what we were told that there appears to be no written 
mobility plan right now. Um, as I say, there, we, we, there was a, um, a consultant hired. Um, and I, other than that, I really can't say exactly what, and I don't think the DPW director can say exactly what this 60,000 would be spent on. But this would be uh, along the lines of ADA type work. Is that what I'm gathering? Uh, ADA and transportation issues. That's my understanding. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Alan. I, if, if, uh, if I'm correct, uh, in the last override, uh, the selectmen pushed uh, some extra money for, for mobility improvements around the town. And I think that amount was 60,000, maybe it was higher, but I think that's where this comes from. It was a board of selectmen uh, push in the, in, as part of the override and the voters approved it. Thank you, you're absolutely correct. Uh, now that you mentioned that. I was trying to clarify whether it was, um, had any overlap with the uh, curb cut money that's in the capital budget, but uh, you're right. This is something additional and it has associated with the 2019 override, thank you. So any other questions or comments on, um, on the um, engineering budget? The engineering budget as recommended. Let's see, I don't see any, I've got the, I think, where? okay. So um, hearing that uh, it's been moved and seconded, no other uh, comments, we'll take a vote on the engineering budget. Grant Gibbion. Says I. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Progress. Yes. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Andy LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. Unanimously passed. Okay, Christine, please proceed. The next is the, um, the, the Public Works uh, Administration budget on the next page, 94. Um, and this is the division that oversees and supports all of the other DPW divisions. Mm -hmm. Um, and also um, helps oversee solid waste as well. Um, you'll see in the, um, it's on page 94. Getting there. And there you go. You'll see the um, $15,586 reduction in salary and wages. And that is because <laughs> the school sustain sustainability coordinator that was in this budget has now been moved to the school budget. Um, so um, it, it was, I think, partly paid in this budget last year and now has been moved completely into the schools. So that is why the, um, the salaries, um, the wages, part of this budget declined. The rest uh, of the budget, the expense uh, budget is level funded from last year. And all of their ex the expenses um, are in line with historical actual expenditures. So I move that we approve the public works admin uh, budget as presented. So is there a second? Second. So the Public Works admin uh, budget is, is moved and seconded for $221,364. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Grant Gibbion? Aye. Shane Blundell? Aye. John Ellis? Aye. Mary Margaret Franklin? Yes. Jonathan Wallach? Oh, Jonathan may not be here. Let's see, he's left. Yeah, Jonathan's not here. Okay. Um, Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokris. 
Yes. Uh, John Dice. Yes. Uh, Alan Jones. Yes. Andy Lacourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Aye. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. The vote is unanimous on the DPW admin. The next is highways, which is on page 98. Uh, this, this division is responsible for all our streets, our sidewalks, rain signs, culverts, street sweeping, and it too um, can fluctuate based on, on weather. Um, there's really nothing um, to report in the salary, the salary cal category. Um, and the expense budget is more or less um, level funded, although you will see a $15,000 increase in um, the budget for uh, pavement markings, 5270. Um, and as uh, according to the director, this is because we have recently been benefited by um, uh, street work on Mass Ave and Summer Street and a few other areas of town where we've been able to get state and federal funds. Um, so we hadn't had to spend our own money on in some of those areas. But now that those those projects are completed, we have to pony up um, more money than we have been paying to take care of our streets. I think that is really the only change in the expense budget. Um, I don't have any other notes of interest. So I would, unless John or George, you want to point out anything, I would move that the highway um, division budget be approved as presented in the manager's budget book. Is there a second? Second. Second. So it's been uh, moved and seconded in the amount of uh, one million eight hundred six thousand seven hundred forty nine dollars. Um, are there any questions for uh, Christine on this um, budget? Shane Blundell. Thanks, Charlie. There are seven vacancies in the department right now. Um, we expect they can still provide all the services that we need and. I mean, it looks like overtime is the same, you know, as sort of as roughly in line with previous years. So do we expect that like the overtime is going to be predictable with all those vacancies? I, since I've been working on this budget, there have always been, there's always been a manpower issue that there's always, there have always been fewer bodies than what the, um, what the director would like. Um, but as we've been talking, as we've been, we've been saying the, he has the ability to move funds around. So, and, and I think people as well. Um, so, um, I, I, I don't have any reason to believe that the overtime budget will be inflated, um, because of these vacancies. Thank you. I would add maybe what Sandy told us or talked to us about, about the general hesitancy to ever remove an existing position, um, part because it requires going to the union and asking that position be removed, and then it becomes harder to add one later. And I think sometimes it's to the detriment of the departments when they have different skill sets that are needed, they don't want to they, they only want to create a new job rather than get rid of an old one because of the process and operational and other kinds of maybe non-financial issues that that they're pressured with. Thanks. Are there any other questions? 
on uh, D DPW Highway. Okay, it's been moved, seconded, no further discussions. We'll vote. Grant Gibbon? Aye. Shane Blundell? Aye. John Ellis? John Ellis? Aye. Aye. Mary Margaret? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Walton. Uh, Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard? Yes. Shailene Pokris? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Oh, he's not here. Uh, John Dice? Yes. Uh, Al Jones? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Alan Tosti? Yes. George Closer? Yes. Dean Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. David McKenna? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the uh, highway budget is passed unanimously. The next budget is snow and ice. Aha. Uh -huh. um, when we met with the director at the end of February, um, he reported that almost all of the 2021 budget had been spent, but for about $130,000. Um, and 20 to $25,000 of that uh, would um, have to be set aside to pay for the cost of uh, putting snow up in um, the St. Camillus parking lot um, or extra property. Um, I can't I can't think of whether what we've had another weather event since, but I'm expecting that the budget will be this year's budget will be exhausted, um, but not by too much. Um, it, you can see that the um, the requested budget for 22, 2022 is the same as this year and that puts us, by my calculations, around 85, 87% of our rolling 10-year average, which is, I think, a little bit more than we wanted to be at. I think, as a policy, we wanted to be around 75%, um, 80%, um, but we'll spend it. So I, I, um, I move that we approve the snow and ice budget at $1,172,013. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, I just have a question, uh, Christine, about your calculating your 10 year average. Uh, I would suggest that you don't use the numbers that are on this page for 2019 and 2020, because 2019 looks to me like it should add up to about uh, 1.4 million. And it, am, I, am I right there? And 2020 should add up to uh, Eight or nine hundred thousand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But we're still right. But we're still in the ballpark here with yeah, this. No, I'm just saying, I have a few hundred thousand here, a few hundred thousand there. You know, um, <laughs> doesn't matter that much. <laughs> just, just uh, having. Pretty little... soon you're talking about some real money, right? <laughs> yeah, we're just having a little humor tonight. That's all. Um, yeah, I think when they did this spreadsheet, they didn't include uh, the overtime or something. I don't know what exactly. Yeah, look, uh, the, the top line didn't Sounds include, right. include it in the summer in the summary. So, okay, so um, it's been moved and seconded. Any further uh, questions or comments on the snow and ice budget? Uh, yeah, I have one question, Christine, um, and it's not going to hold up my vote to uh, to accept this budget. But do you know what the actual expense is? I just lost it there. For uh, for 2021 is say through December 31st of 2020. How much actual money has been spent out of the budget? No, all I know is that um, as of February 26th, all but 130,000 had been spent. Okay. Oh no, you did say that. Okay, thank you. I'm all set. Uh, any other questions on the DPW budget of snow and ice? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, so <clears throat> Grant Gibeon? Aye. Uh, Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Aye. Uh, Mary Margaret? Yes. Jonathan um, Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard? Yes. Shailene Pokris? Yes. John Deist? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Bill Keller? 
Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKinnon. Yes. Snow and ice is uh, unanimously passed. Um, are we through or do we have another? We have a couple of more. We have oh, solid more. waste next. Solid waste. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a fun fun budget. Okay. Go so right ahead. You, so what you see are um, contractual increases. Um, the our disposal contract hmm. was recently reviewed renewed for five years. Our collection contract expires in FY20, at the end of FY22, that's right, right, George and John? It's, or 23, I can't. In calendar 23, yeah. so end okay. of FY22. Um, and um, the, the town is expecting to put out an RFP um, in September or October of this year if the town can't come to an agreement with our current um, hauler. And I think we should expect some significant increases in this budget starting in FY23. Um, I don't know, George, John, if you have anything you want to add regarding the solid waste budget. One of the major issues is that we've been paying nothing for the hauling of our recycling, which is in the ballpark of 5,000 tons per year. And a worst case scenario, given that the value of the recycling is very low, is that we might be charged about the same rate per ton for hauling our recyclables as our regular waste stream. So 5,000 tons at $70 a ton would be an increase of about $350,000. Nobody's proposing that to be very clear, but just to put kind of a, a rough number on what the worst case might be. Are there any questions, Annie? Yes. So our disposal contract was settled for how many years, Chris? And do you know what the uh, rate of increase is? Five years, and I believe it was two and a half or three percent increase each year. Okay. Which and our last our last budget our last contract I think was two and a half percent. Yes. That makes sense. And so that covers solid waste disposal and also residual disposal in the budget, or do you not know? That, that yard, that takes care of yard waste and solid waste disposal and residuals. Mm -hmm. um, I think residual disposal as well. Okay. And we pay for both collection and disposal by the ton? Yes. Okay. All right. So that food scrap diversion is probably paying for itself. It will help. Yeah. Oh, it's not paying for itself. Yeah, it's not paying for itself, but it's it's a aid, it's a help. It's it teach it 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 doesn't pay for itself, but it teaches us about food scrap diversion and a possible mandate from the state would be that every community has to do food scrap diversion and that would have additional costs as well because it costs money to pick up food scraps. So your ship is not paying for itself because I'm putting out about 10 pounds of food scraps a week, and I'm probably putting out two pounds of crap. Rough. We did. We were in the calculation with Mike. I don't have the numbers in front of me. George, do you have the numbers? I'm not sure we have agreement on that. Um, when I ran the calculations, it seemed that it was breaking even, but I'm not sure we ever 
came to closure on that. So that might be a, a future discussion. All right. Well, it'll be interesting to see where we had. I mean, I, I'm paying for my food scraps, so town's not, I'm not in that 50,000, but um, uh, anyways, thanks. Peter Howard. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christine, I didn't <laughs> quite keep up with you. Um, the five, re five year renewal, was that for collection? <laughs> disposal. For disposal. That, so our, our contract was renewed for five years. Our collection contract is going to expire in FY23. Uh, and the, but the collection hasn't been done. Oh, oh it uh, has another year to go then. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions? I, I would comment on the food scraps. Uh, like Andy, uh, I do pay for our food scraps to be taken away. Um, and uh, I also have a dog and she consumes a lot of food scraps too. So. That might be one solution is they have a dog. Um, is, is there a, um, a, a, a salary section to this? No. These are all outside charges, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's, have you moved this budget, Christine? No, you haven't. I so move it. So the, is second. there a second? Section. Okay. So, uh, it's been moved in second for the solid waste budget for um, four million and eleven thousand six hundred seventy five dollars. Any further questions or discussion for the solid for the DPW uh, group? Peter, your hands up It's from before I take it. I'm sorry. OK. <clears throat> Grant Gibbon. Aye. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Oh, he's not here. Uh, John Deist. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Uh, the, the solid waste uh, budget is passed unanimously. The next budget is the uh, motor equipment repair division on page 104. And this is the division that takes care of all the DPW and facility vehicles. Um, it's pretty much uh, a level funded bu budget um, I note that so far it looks like uh, 40, approximately 40,000 have has been spent in the maintenance line already this year. Um, so the 55,000 seems uh, appropriate. Um, so I don't have anything more on that budget. And so I would move that we accept the motor equipment repair budget as printed at 443-866. Is, is there a second? Second. So it's been moved and second for the uh, motor equipment repair budget at uh, 400 and I'm sorry, $443,866. Um, are there any, any further questions or discussion? Grant Gibbon. Aye. Shane Blundell. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Mary Margaret. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokers. Yes. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. That um, motor equipment uh, division budget is passed unanimously. The next one is cemeteries. Uh, 
Um, there's a slight increase in the wages category because of a new hire at a very slight, at a slightly higher salary. Other than that, there's, there's nothing new. Um, it's a level funded expense budget. Um, and uh, with that, I would recommend that uh, we approve the cemetery budget at 284680. Other, is there a second? Second. Uh, are there any questions on the cemetery uh, salaries and expenses as presented? Peter. Um, this, is the, this may not be in this budget, but the transfer from perpetual care to capital budget, um, I couldn't find a, a, a warrant article on that. Uh, do you know where that, we voted at uh, last, last um, at the last meeting? Um, 51. Article fifty-one. Oh, there it is. Oh, maybe that was added. Oh, I think it was there. Thank you. It's seventy-three now. Seventy-three. Yes. And Peter's right, the offset, the 150,000 offset comes from um, either perpetual care or loss and graves. Mr. Chair? Yes, Alan. Uh, when, we vote, uh, when we vote the cemetery, uh, can I recommend that also uh, contingent in that vote is the $150,000 from the cemetery uh, perpetual care. Just trying to avoid an extra vote. Oh, you mean in case uh, we're required to have another uh, explicitly voted? Well, we usually vote that Warren article. We voted it for the 10,000 from the capital, but we haven't voted the 150,000 from public works. So when we vote the, this public works budget cemetery, uh, I amend that we're also adding the 150,000 of taking it from perpetual care in that article. Thank, thank you, Alan. I think we'll accept that as a friendly amendment. So uh, any further comments on the um, cemetery uh, budget? <clears throat> so can you go up to the prior page, uh, Alan? Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded to vote for the uh, uh, in favor of the uh, cemetery budget for a net of two hundred eighty-four thousand six hundred eighty dollars, including four hundred thirty-four thousand six hundred eighty dollars in basic expenses and an offset from the uh, cemetery fund of one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is there any further questions or any further discussion on this? Grant Gibbian. Vote aye. Uh, Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokers. Yes. Uh, John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Alan Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. And David McKenna. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, pass unanimously, Peter. And the only two things left in the DPW budget are street lining and traffic signals, which are both level funded from last year. Um, and I don't have anything to add to either. <laughs> so uh, I move that uh, both the street lighting and traffic signals budget be approved as contained in the manager's budget. And what is the uh, street street lighting? It's 100, 115,000 and what's the tra traffic signals are? The same, 115,000. Okay, so what, uh, I think we'll then, since there's the same amount of money, we'll just vote it. Um, 
simultaneously. So it's been moved and seconded to vote uh, the street lighting budget and the traffic signals budget at 115,000 each. I'm, I'm sorry, actually, was there a second? Second. Second. So it's moved and seconded for each of the street lighting budget and the um, traffic signals budget to be voted at 115,000 each. Um, is there any further discussion on these budgets? Grant Gibeon? Aye. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Mary Margaret? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard? Yes. Shailene Pogris? Yes. There, um, John Dice? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. David yes. McKenna? Yes. So the street lighting and the traffic signals uh, are voted unanimously at $115,000 each. Thank you. I think we're done, Christine, right? We are done. Thank you, George and John. Thank you, Christine, George, and John. <laughs> Great. So um, let's see if we can get a um, um, one Warren article out of the way, which should be sort of quick. Dean Carmen, um, would you bring up the um, school committee stipend, please? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't have the exact number. I don't think I, I didn't open it quick. I had it open. Maybe I closed it. I can get it back open. Hold on. The new article 69, vote to appropriate a school's committee member stipend. So this was an article that appeared before the committee last year. Um, what it is allowing to happen is for the school committee who are the only elected board in town that do not receive a stipend to begin receiving a stipend of $3,000. So um, I think just that's, that's, that's what we would be voting to approve it. My, we, we talked to us last year, last year when it came up, I urged the committee to vote favorable action. So my, my reasons are, are, are the same. And, and that is when, well, one of the things you learn about elected officials when you, when you talk to them is that upon becoming an elective official, you have all of these newfound obligations that occurred, right? So you start getting invited to these events and conferences and different different things like that. And because you're in the a public official, you you go, right? So it's the thing you do. And the, but those things come with cost. And so what you learn, and I think Annie would do a far better job than me at explaining it, is you don't actually make money being a pub, an elected official. You know, like the select board who has a $3,000 stipend, the assessors who have a $4,900 stipend. A lot of times that money, in the case, definitely the case of the select board, goes to the different things you're doing as, a, as an elected official. And so all this is doing is providing a stipend to effectively reimburse them for costs they're occurring as school committee members. So I urge favorable action. Second. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you, Dean. Do we have any uh, questions on the stipend? Yes, uh, Peter Howard. Uh, we did vote for it last year. I, I don't know whether, whether Dean said that or not. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other comments? Andy, did you wanna make any comment on this? Um, just to say that in particular for school committee members who frequently are motivated to run because they have children in the schools, the child care costs alone when um, you're a member of a two working, um, uh, two working adult household um, are certainly, certainly eat up this stipend pretty quickly. And if I just looked at it in terms of when I was on the select board, um, hours I did not spend doing my job and did not get paid for, it would be eaten up pretty quickly. So it is not profitable for people. It's not a motivator for people to run, but it is a kind of a sign of respect for people's 
um, volunteer time, their dedication of their time to um, what I think is a pretty um, uh, responsible position in town with regard to you know operations and managing the budget and so on and so forth. Thank you, Annie. Um, Alan Tassi. Yeah. Um, well, somebody could correct me. I think everybody should understand there is a possible additional cost beyond the $3,000. And that is uh, elected officials who get paid are also eligible for employee health insurance. Now, uh, there used to be one or two selectmen who took it. I don't know if anybody takes it now, um, but, but that is a possible cost depending upon uh, how many of the school committee uh, do take it. They're not eligible for retiree health insurance because their salaries are below 5,000 and therefore they're not eligible for pension. And if they're not eligible for pension, they're not eligible for retiree health insurance. But there is that possible extra cost. Um, I'm in favor of this, um, but I do have one question, uh, Dean. Uh, do we have to appropriate money in this or is it coming out of the school budget? So we, we didn't settle on this last year. I mean, I think the general thought is it's, it's a rounding error in the school budget. So it would just come from that. Um, and then on, on your first point, I had actually um, looked into that when this came up last year, the issue of health insurance. And I talked to Doug Heim about it. And I, I guess this is something that kind of missed us. So many years ago, the, the committee, um, had pushed on the select board to end the process of um, part-time elected officials receiving health insurance. And, and at the time we were told that the select board could do that by policy, but the existing members were uncomfortable ending the practice for themselves or the existing members of the committee. What Doug told me is that by practice and policy, the select board has ended um, allowing members to get health insurance when the new select board members come on. So as people come off, they are the new members are not allowed to receive the, the benefits. So at the last time I checked, there were no members. As of last year, there were no members receiving <laughs> health insurance. Now, I didn't remember that until he brought it up, but he, he brought it up pretty convincingly to me. So the school committee would have to adopt a similar policy? So they would have to go to the select board to be exempted from the select board policy because the select board policy covers everyone. Okay, thank you. So Dean, the, just to sort of clarify what you just said, then um, this is not, a, under the current circumstances, unless there's an exception granted by the board of selectmen, uh, this is not a potential extra cost for the school committee members. That is what town council told me last year, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Dean, you had your hand up before. Council of last year, yes. You, you didn't have any question, okay. And Al Tassi, your hand is still up or not? Nope. Okay. Um, any other questions on the stipends for the members of the school committee? Okay, so then, um, Dean, you moved it. Uh, is there a second? Second. So it's moved and seconded. Um, Grant Gibeon. Aye. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene yes. Pokris. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. Oh, he's not here, sorry. John Dice. Yes. John Donald Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Mel Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. It's a passing out. Yes. Thank you very much. So um, the, the uh, Mary Margaret, are you ready to pick up on the enterprise? Mary Margaret, are you ready? Sure. We, somebody's got their mic uh, their mic on and it's echoing here. You can check that. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Please go ahead. 
Okay. Um, so I need someone to. Um, we're going to do wreck and rain. Alan Jones. You're the, you're the uh, budget budget presenter man. <laughs> All right, I just lost the whole thing. Oh, sorry. I think we're going on wreck and rink. Yeah, rec recreation. It's on page one seventy one. We're doing wreck or rink. Uh, it's recreation to start. That's okay. on 171. <clears throat> well, on 172, I guess. All right. Do you want to know how much is left in the fund first? I think we want to go to 172, Al. Thank you. Yes, go right ahead. Okay, so left in the fund is $378,446.96. Okay. Okay. All right, so Joe came back. Um, so also the budget has changed a little bit or the way he... he the way he likes to, to see it. So, um, so some of the things he said are that the, you know, the revenue comes in the previous year, um, they took a loss in 2020 because of the pandemic, but expects uh, 2021 to be positive. If you look on that page with all the contracted services and whatever, he has, um, he likes to break those down into the different quarters, which you'll see below. And let's see. Uh, let's, what else did I say? Okay, so some of the things he talked about, um, the contracted services are the people mentioned below. Um, he can only take 14 kids at a time for the remote learning days for the after school program but he is running his after school program. Um, it is my understanding that the debt service line item 5871 is the bond payment on the reservoir project. Let's see what else do we wanna say about that? Um, also he will, if you look at the salaries, he apportions his time between rec and rank. And as far as recreation goes, those are the programs. And I don't know what more to say about the programs. Um, let's see. And um, Charlie, when you and I talked about um, changing that one column, and you had said that um, in the 2021 budget book, it should be 376,757. Yes. But he, um, what did he say? Oh, actually, I think this one, I think this is, this one is correct. What you said. It's the other one where he changed it. Well, I think, um, I think that uh, Dean and, and a couple of the members of the committee are going to be talking to to Ida and uh, Sandy about the differences in these uh, the budgets. Right. Um, and and Alan and I discussed those differences. So the the four uh, <laughs> sixty five three thirty four that's there includes some positions that aren't shown on this chart. Um, and, and, I, and I think they'll resolve that question, Mary Marty. Right. So, um, 
So actually, it's when we get to the rank where he changed the number. So okay. yeah, so we have that number that um, should be 376, 757. Um, he has a director and a supervisor of recreation. Um, the assistant director does the special ed work. But um, that person now does both the special ed work and the coordination as the assistant director. So Joe has himself being paid by spending 80% of his time at the rack and 20% at um, the rink. So I hope that explains the rack because I don't know what else to say about it. I, I think that's uh, pretty complete. I think it's, uh, it's just a, interesting to note that um, in fiscal 20 and 21, he shows a substantial number of uh, income categories not coming in because of the COVID, but it looks like uh, in fiscal 22, they're forecasting that uh, many of these programs are going to come back. Yes. You know, and he's already running that after school program, um, following all the rules and keeping all the kids safe. Um, okay, so I think that's all I want to say about it. So are you making the motion uh, for the uh, budget of uh, $1,720,882 in expenses and an equivalent amount uh, in revenues for a zero balance on the basis of a fund balance of $378,447? That was exactly what I was going to say. I, that's what I thought. Second. Um, second. <laughs> um, so does anybody have any questions for Mary Margaret on the recreation budget? Oh, wait, I've, I lost my participant. Hang on a second. Um, yeah, now I got it. So any questions for Mary Margaret? Um, I think I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, you know, he's forecasting the balance. He's got a balance in the account and he's forecasting mm -hmm. a zero, um, you know, no loss for the year. So um, seeing that there are no questions, it's been moved and seconded. We'll take a vote on the um, uh, recreation budget. Well, uh, I should say enterprise fund budget. Uh, Grant Gib Gibbian. Aye. Jane. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter yes. Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokers. Yes. John Deist. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Okay. Um, it's passed unanimously. So it's a 10 to 10. We'll see if we can finish, uh, if you can finish the next budget, uh, okay. Margaret, the, the um, rink budget. That's the ring. All right, do you want to know what's the first the number in the enterprise fund? Yes, the balance. Yes, yes. please. It's 41,020, 020, and 98 cents. Thank you. Okay, so like I said, Joe splits his time between rec and rank. Um, so the rank is 20% of his time. Uh, if you look in the, um, the telephone line item 5215, there's no expense there because he said he doesn't use the phone. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, and the concession stand, they can't open during the pandemic, so that's why they're not making any money off of that. Um, let's see, what else did he say? There, and there's minimal use of the vending machines as well. Um, so at the beginning of 2020, they closed down until August. Um, and get the, at that point, we're getting the rink ready. Um, 
and there was, you know, several weeks of lost revenue there just from vending machines and the concession stand. Uh, let's see, five, two, nine. Let me say. Oh, the non-ice rental. There were other uses of the um, the rink that was not for ice. Like, it's, it, what's the name? I don't know what the name of that game is that you play that's like soccer. They also did in, indoor baseball practice and it was used for fifth grade dances. So, and he's also proposing a $5 rental increase for next year and may be able to shift some of the expenses to recreation. Um, so that number in the budget book should be not 191, but 178,262. Which, which number is that? Can you go? That's in the budget book I, column, let's see. The FY 2021 budget book column, instead of that 191, 234, it should be 178, 262. But that's when he was saying he thinks it should be 174, 528. Because, and what's the reason why? Oh, because the assistant director is what I explained before, they eliminated that position and yeah, so the um, so are, are there, are director any, has eliminated, what? Mary Margaret, are there any changes to the fiscal year 22 salary? Uh, you know, the total is 182,610. Uh, on line 5101. So if we could, if, if uh, Alan, you could go down to the salary detail, please. Oh, 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 oh. here we go. Um, so I did not. 182,820 is the same number, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I didn't change that, and the change he made was in the fiscal twenty-one. But that's the yeah. presentation issue. So, so that number doesn't change. Therefore, the the uh, proposal for the rink costs don't change. So, if, if you could slide up back to the uh, right there, whoop, 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 the income. I, I would just point out to the members that. Um, his revenue expenses have dropped, but he also has increased the the the, the trend. When it says transfer for other funds, forty nine seventy two, that's subsidy from the general fund going into the rink. Right. Which is why I think he's gonna he will try to raise the rental for the ice time to five dollars. Uh, let's see what else is there I can say about that. Peter Howard, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, Mary Margaret, did, see, did you happen to mention why the refrigeration contract is so much bigger? Uh, no, I didn't ask that, sorry. But I can. <clears throat> Well, it's actually uh, lower than it was in 2019, Peter. If, if you believe those numbers. It's a lot higher than it was in 2020 though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I did not ask him, but I can. Hmm. So what do you want to do next? Wait for me to get the answer. No, I think I think it's a, it's a you can get get us that in number informationally. 
uh, it's not going to change the the overall um, activity by a substantial amount. So if you could just check on that and get back to us, Mary right. Margaret. And then, um, I do want to say that he has been pretty resourceful in trying to get revenue when during these times and still providing a, a place for the kids. And, and I'll also safe. comment that he's trying to do this budget so it more accurately reflects what's really going on, I think. Um, so in, in, in some cases, we, <coughs> uh, blanks and things, he's, he's moving stuff around. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, uh, 5203, and five, uh, five two six nine, uh, those are the, the same thing, I believe. And uh, <coughs> he has uh, uh, money in one and not on the other, as I recall. Anyway, uh, he, he just commented that he's trying to work this budget around so so it makes more sense and more accurately reflects what's going on. Right, because he likes to have have it broken into the quarters so he can see how it works. And so he went back to that kind of um, presenting. Okay, uh, Mary Margaret, do you wanna make a motion? Oh, uh, yes. Please approve the budget as printed. So it's for $593,004 in expenses an equivalent amount in revenues with a balance in the uh, Rink Enterprise, Ed Burns Rink Enterprise Fund of $41,621. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any further questions for uh, Mary Margaret on or John on this budget? Okay, so we'll vote. Grant Gibbion? Aye. Shane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis. Mary, yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Yes. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCord. Yes. Bill Keller. Aye. Alan Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine yes. Deckler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Uh, the rink, uh, Ed Burns rink budget is unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. So that's 10 o'clock. Um, any other questions or issues before a motion to adjourn is in order? I see none. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second. Okay. Any objections? So moved. <laughs> Hearing no objections, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Right, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.